Welcome to worship. Please join me in our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. Amen. Thank you for leading a wonderful song about the great things that uh, Jesus Christ has done for us. We welcome you to Fern Creek United Methodist Church on this seventh Sunday of Easter, also known as Ascension Sunday. And I would like to begin by sharing with you just a little bit more about the reentry plan for starting in-person worship again here at Fern Creek. Uh, before I say anything about that, uh, last Friday or a week ago Friday, I sent out a video describing this in quite detail, and that's an important video for you to watch. Not only uh, that you might know the dates and, and the times and how we're adjusting our worship service uh, when we're having those things, but also for some of the reasoning behind that as well. So make sure to watch that video. It was sent out uh, through the email broadcast. It's on our website. You can find it on the phone app in several places. And then this past Wednesday, I sent that, I resent that out with some updated information in another broadcast email. So it's very important. Now at this time, as we're entering these first couple of phases, we can only have worship, worship only in person during this time period. That might be for the next several weeks, the next couple of months. We're not sure until we get uh, further say-so from Bishop Fairley and the COVID-19 task force that we're kind of under during this time. So it'll be only for worship, but exciting for me, we're going to begin the in-person worship again. Now listen close, two different times, two different days. On June 4th, which is a Thursday night. This has been the day we've been doing the recordings of the worship service. And so we're going to open that up as a worship service. And Tom, without you knowing, will be recording the service that he can also put out on Sunday morning and as a whole full entire service, not just the sermon like we did before the COVID-19. So uh, we're going to have worship on Thursday, and then we're also going to have worship on Sunday, June 7th. It'll be the first in-person uh, service again. That will be at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's a little different. Make sure you get the time changes there. That's right between our other two normal times of worship that we had before COVID-19. So June 4th, Thursday at 6.30, June 7th, Sunday at 10 o'clock. Now, I want to uh, really say this to you. There's going to be three ways that you can participate in the service. One would be coming on Thursday, one Sunday, but also by still being at home, watching the full service on video. And that's one reason we want to provide that. 
we realize right now that many of our folks still might be in the, the high risk for the COVID-19. And we want to encourage you, actually, feel free to stay home and, and watch that service. And in fact, it might be the best thing for you to do uh, even for quite some time. So that's for those over 65, uh, those with complicating factors like asthma and, and lung problems, diabetes, and there's several other things we've talked about. And al also those whose immune systems uh, are, have been compromised with cancer, or radiation treatment, those kinds of things as well. We want you to be safe and don't feel guilty at all by you still being home watching online. We, we want to encourage that. But for those who do come out, it's going to be quite different. We're all going to be wearing masks. Um, some, some are, and Daryl's kind of wearing one even for this service, and we'll be all having to wear masks. Um, we want you to bring your own mask. Uh, if you can, if you forget, or if a visitor shows up and doesn't have a mask, we'll have some disposable ones, disposable ones there, or even some of the ladies are making some of the cloth masks for us as well. And so we will have those, but, but try to bring your own mask, probably the most sanitary thing to do as well. So make sure you do that. Um, our two services, I did want to mention this, they're going to be blended, uh, kind of like we've been doing here uh, for these online services. So far, we'll have both traditional and contemporary praise songs and different elements from both of those services. We're doing that because we can only videotape one service, and we didn't want to just provide either like a contemporary service if we had that on Thursday night, or just a traditional if we had that on Thursday. So that's why we're doing it, and, and it's just a great time for us to enjoy, actually expand our horizons, I say, in the music. You know, I, my line I've always drawn with music was if it lifts up the name of Jesus and praise Him, I'm going to sing it. I, whether it's a hymn, whether it's a praise song, whether it's uh, cantatas like we do, I, just, I'm going to sing for the Lord. I encourage you to do that as well. We'll also be practicing social distancing when we first come back in person, which means you'll walk into the sanctuary and you'll notice half of the pews will be kind of blocked off just, just by tape or something where you won't be able to enter. And then we're going to have to kind of socially uh, be socially distancing on each pew as well. Now, we'll encourage our families who come. If you've got four, five, or six, you can all sit side by side if you're under the same house, uh, under the same roof, same household you're welcome to sit side by side. So that's why we're doing both the services as well, to provide room for that. Um, we do have some volunteer needs since we're doing a Thursday night service and a Sunday morning service. We're going to need um, some folks to volunteer for the cleaning crew. Now, I'm, I'm excited about this. We're going to have a deep clean on June 1st. And um, so that, that's the opportunity for some who sign up for that team. You can be part of the deep clean before we even re-enter. But then each, after each service, we have to clean and, and sanitize and all those kinds of things. I found out from Cheryl Giltner today, who's overseeing that, that 15 people have already signed up uh, for the cleaning team. So I'm, I'm really excited. Actually, that's what I was excited about. I think I said I was excited about doing the deep clean, but I'm really excited about so many people who have signed up. We've also had some people call Sylvia concerning being ushers, extra ushers, and we need extra greeters as well. And uh, so Sylvia Kohler for uh, ushers and Stephanie Culver for greeters, if you'd like to help in that way. But thank you for your cooperation. Everybody's been wonderful. We really thank you. And as we keep moving and just adjusting in the ways we have to adjust, I thank you for your faithfulness and I thank you for your flexibility. And that's a continued word that we're going to lift up. We're going to have to be flexible during this time. Uh, in Jesus' name, now we'll have the reading of the psalm. Reading from Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with a voice of joy. For the Lord most high is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob whom he loves. God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. Our Father in heaven, as we enter your courts with praise, as we come to you this morning to give you your due, as we gather, we want to praise your name. We want to give it its 
honor. We want to uh, lift your name up and lift it on high. We ask, Lord, as we do so, that you bless our service this morning. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we're going to head into our uh, children's moment. Amen and good morning. Again, we miss you every week. We miss you more and more. Today, we commemorate Ascension Sunday. To ascend, obviously, means to go up. We are uh, uh, celebrating that time when Jesus ascended into heaven and all that that entailed. Now, it also ushered in a time of waiting. And I wanted to uh, bring to your attention the fact that we're, we're all waiting right now, aren't we? We are waiting to get out of our homes. We're waiting to get back to school. We're waiting to get back to church. And we're excited for all of those events uh, and when they'll finally uh, come to fruition. Now, when Jesus ascended, there was also a time of waiting that was ushered in. The Holy Spirit came down, that promise of the Father. We're thankful for that. But yet we wait for the return of Jesus Christ. The apostles did, as do we. Now, while we're sitting at home waiting to get back to wherever we're going to get back, whether it's school or church or work or, or whatever, we shouldn't waste that time. We should use that time in a positive way. We can pray. We can do constructive projects. We can spend more time with family. We can read Scripture. We can read good books. Those are the kinds of things we can do to stay engaged and busy as we wait for those wonderful events to come back. Now, as we await for Jesus to come back, there are also some things we can be engaged in. Again, prayer, Bible study, telling others about Him, uh, getting engaged online and, and sharing, being a witness, uh, getting into um, other things that are positive that can help you uh, get closer to God. You know, when I think about Jesus' ascension, uh, I, I think about the, the movie Up. Remember that? The parents, you've seen it. The kids have seen it where Carl took all those balloons and, and he made his house go up. Well, at some point, the house did come down. I think about if I were to have a helium balloon and I let it go outside, I have no idea where it's going to come down, but you can bet at some point it will come down. But I can't sit around and just wait and just look up in the sky and say, I can't wait for that balloon to come down. I need to be productive. I need to be in prayer. I need to be in Bible study. I need to be doing things that are uplifting and edifying to the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this Ascension Sunday and all that that means. I ask, Lord, that you bless the young folks at home and their parents, their families. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we head into a time of giving, we're going to have a prayer over the offering. We're thankful, again, that you have been so generous in giving uh, since we've been out. Uh, Father in heaven, we are grateful for a generous church, a loving church, a praying church. Father, I ask now that you bless the gifts, uh, the offerings, the tithes. Uh, may they be all be used uh, to further your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. is my reward and all of my devotion now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy through every trial my soul will see no turning back
salvation And His hope will never fail Heaven is our home Through every storm Our soul will sing Jesus is here To God be the glory
Uh, we just continue to praise the Lord uh, for who He is, that we can build our life on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. This being Ascension Sunday, I'm reminded of one of the things, the powerful things about Christ who has ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father as He's making intercession for us even now, as well as the Holy Spirit who intercedes. And as we come to this time of uh, a, a community time of prayer, pastoral prayer, um, we especially remember, again, a few of our folks, um, Julia Danta, who is home recovering from knee replacement surgery, just received this request uh, not long before I, I came today, and it's to lift up Rick Coates, who is uh, Lloyd Marvel's uh, stepbrother, uh, and he's in very, very serious condition in the hospital, um, especially as of Monday. So let us keep Rick in our prayers. And another several others. We've had some glory sightings, and, and that's been some neat things to see. Some folks have actually got to see their doctors here lately, and that's been good. Also, we're appreciative, we're appreciative of Mary Helen, who comes out and plays for us. And she's, again, kind of waiting on surgery. She's kind of in that waiting period that... Uh, I think um, Daryl was talking about as you're waiting, I think, for June 11th. So we're praying for Mary Helen as well. But let's bow as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that uh, as we come before you in praise and thanksgiving, that we can build the foundation of our life uh, upon who you are. And Jesus, you, you've built that foundation. You have built it through your death and resurrection. You have built it through the, the incredible height and depth and width of your love uh, for us and that you died in our place and took our sin upon you uh, that we could not only know you and know of you and teach about you and share about you, but that you can live in us, that the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, can dwell deep within us and, and empower us to be able to share good news and what you have done for us and meant uh, to us, to other people as well. We thank you for who you are and we worship you. Jesus, I thank you that as you were here on this earth and as you continue to be for us as you live today and we experience your living presence, but you would touch the eyes of the blind and they could see and the lame would be, uh, would be able to walk again and you raise the dead. It's the power of who you are. 
And uh, Lord, we just pray again, the outpouring of your power, the outpouring of your healing upon our uh, nation, upon our world in this time again of the COVID-19 virus. We pray for healing. We not only pray for healing, we pray for wholeness for people, uh, Lord. And, and we do pray, we pray for a cure. And we realize you are the cure for what ails us in, in our sin sickness in so many ways. And you are the great physician. And so we turn to you as well. I thank you again for the frontline workers and people who have, just, who have been working hour upon hour while many of us have been waiting and, and not able to do our jobs maybe in certain ways or quite in different ways. But thank you for these who have been giving care to those that we are unable at least physically give care to at this time, but we pray for them. Thank you for these persons. Lord, I thank you for the church. Look forward again when we can, as the body of Christ comes together, there's something about the body and worshiping you together. Your manifest glory comes. You, you empower people through your Holy Spirit. Lord, as I think of 120 in the upper room will be filled with your Holy Spirit. It wasn't a big congregation, but it was 120 people that you filled and changed for an eternity. And so, Lord, we look forward to that and your feeling of our lives uh, day by day in the fullness of your Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray now. And, Lord, we pray the words you have taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please join me in a hymn of praise. All power, hail the power of Jesus' name. beautiful song of, of praise to Jesus Christ, all the wonderful songs of praise to who Jesus uh, is uh, for us today. I'll be reading from Acts uh, chapter 1 verses 1 through 11, this being Ascension Sunday and it's the uh, main Ascension passage. We had one of the Ascension Psalms that Daryl read earlier as well. But uh, here again the Word of God. In my former book Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Paul will actually tell us he, he appeared to more than 500 even at one time, as, as well, of course, the disciples and some of the ladies. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he 
gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now they were thinking still kind of that political nation, the one God nation of Israel in, in, in the scheme of things. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority. In fact, that's God's thing. You let God do that. That's His thing. That's not what you focus on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after He said this, He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid Him, or some believe the manifest glory of God in His presence, hid Him from their sight. And they were looking intently into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking in the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Uh, I thank you for the gospel writer Luke, the man who knew and experienced your death and resurrection your salvation, the filling of the Holy Spirit in his life, guided to write this gospel for us as a testimony of who you are, Jesus. And I'm thankful he started the book of Acts right here. Come Holy Spirit, we pray. Help us to see who we are in Christ by way of his ascension and the power that we might have dwell within us in his presence as we can be witnesses for him. Him. Come Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen and amen. Um, the title of today's sermon is why we uh, shouldn't skip Ascension Day or Ascension Sunday and the all essential necessity of it. I tried to work in a few more words into that title, but Tom can't get them all on the screen. So anyway, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to dare say that most of you who are tuning in this morning did not realize that this is Ascension Sunday. Raise your hand at home if you didn't realize that. Or I'm going to go one step further out on the limb by saying you didn't realize that Thursday of this week, actually the day we're taping, is Ascension Day. Day 40 from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, from what we know as Easter Sunday. I might also guess that if I had not chosen to preach on this passage and had skipped it in light of another passage, that 98% of you, or I might say 99.8% of you, it, you wouldn't have bat an eye about that. It would have been no problem. But here's the problem. It's my confession. I've often skipped this Sunday as a pastor. Sometimes in light of staying with a series I had started or preaching on something that I thought would be more timely. And by the way, we're in something timely, right? With all the COVID-19, which we have been sharing about. Uh, and and uh, I, I rarely actually preached on the Ascension on Ascension Sunday. Now I have somewhat, but not always. And, I, and many others have skipped over this day also, including songwriters. Any amens from the worship People, songwriters and worship leaders. Do you know how many songs that we have to choose from to celebrate the birth of Jesus? Jesus coming from heaven to earth? There are scores and scores of songs about Jesus, the Word made flesh. Or how many songs that have been written about Jesus' death? And I praise God for that, and we will not miss Good Friday. It is the centrality of the Christian experience. And how many celebratory songs we have to give thanks for Jesus' resurrection? Um, it's wonderful. I love coming in here in the high, you know, and just that praise to Jesus Christ of His resurrection. There's hundreds of these. The, you know what the problem we have at Christmas and on Good Friday and on Easter? You know what the problem we have with songs is which ones we have to leave out, right? There's so many to choose from. Which ones can we focus on this time? That's not true of Ascension Sunday. In fact, the other day, Tom, we were looking them up, weren't we? And there's a lot of them we didn't even know that were for Ascension Sunday. Sunday. Very, isn't it interesting? Very few songs about Jesus' movement going back to heaven. All kinds of songs about Him coming down. Very few about Him going back. And so today I'm incredibly thankful that Luke chose not to skip this all-important, absolutely essential experience of who Christ is and the instructions that He's left for us. 
In fact, it's the first thing that he focuses on, that Luke focuses on, when he writes his second volume of his two works, which is the book of Acts, personally addressing this book, or some would say he dedicated the book to a guy named Theophilus. And by the way, sometimes you would dedicate a book. Sometimes it was the direct invitation to someone you're addressing. Theophilus, remember, was addressed in Luke's gospel as the most excellent Theophilus, probably, probably yeah, an actual person, a high Roman official who had been seeking God and discovering who Jesus Christ is. His name means friend of God or loved by God. And so, in a broader scope, Luke writes the book of not only the gospel, but the book of Acts to all of us. Because guess what? We're all loved by God. And so it's a direct invitation for us to come and see who this Jesus is. Luke wrote his gospel. Remember, he tells us this in verse 1 of Acts. He wrote his gospel to tell us about all the things that Jesus, don't miss the word, began to do and to teach until Ascension Day, which we're celebrating today. We might say it this way then. The gospel was about all the things that Jesus did and that he taught. But now, Luke says, I'm writing to let you know about all the things that Jesus will continue to do and the things He will continue to teach through, guess who? Us. His church. His body. And the things that Jesus was doing, He said, church, I'm going to continue right on with this plan of God. But it's coming through you. You know, I, I'm, I always think of the words in John uh, that uh, Jesus spoke to His disciples be, before He would face His uh, his arrest and his death. And he said these words, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these. And then he has a comma. And then he says these words, because I am going to the Father. And because I'm ascending, there's some important things, Jesus is saying, that you have to know about what it means that I've ascended and where I've ascended to and what that means as far as Jesus' power and authority and all kinds of things for us today. Acts 1-2, in fact, he says, he says, now he was taken up to heaven, and then the very first thing he says, you know, I'm going to tell you that he was taken up to heaven that day after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. You, you cannot get past the fact that much of Acts 1 and Acts 2 and the book of Acts is the mandate of Jesus Christ for us to be his witnesses. You can't escape the fact. The word is used in some nuance 39 times in this book. It is about being witnesses. The last words, you know, we always hang on someone's last words before they leave. The last words, Jesus says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And that word witness is a, is a powerful word, guys. It, it really tells us kind of the depths of what it means that I'm a follower of Christ and why I need the power of the Holy Spirit. But the word witness in the Greek is martus. And it means simply this, one who avows or asserts or professes openly what they have seen, know, or heard. And we might even say experience in that way. The word martyr, we get the word martyr, you know, from this Greek word. And that's someone who bears testimony for another person or a cause with their death. I, I so believe this, that I will give my life for this call. That's the word used, folks, in the beginning of Acts. When Jesus said, now I'm going to work through you to win to the ends of the earth. Um, and guess what? Many people have given their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. Sometime early in this week, I was, you know, Sheila and I, we, we, we kind of really been old-fashioned. We just had regular TV cable for a long time, and my sister gave us an Amazon Fire Stick or something. And so we finally, I quit being lazy, and we hooked it up during this COVID time because, you know, she was like, it'd be nice to watch some movies. So the other day, I was watching a movie on Monday, and it finished, and I was reading. I wasn't even paying attention, and whatever it was, Prime or Netflix or whatever, the next movie that came up was End of the Spear. How many of y'all, have? some of you have watched In the Spear? And I thought, I'm going to watch that again. I watched it in 2005 when it came out. I watched it. We rented it and watched it. This was probably my third or fourth time. Now, End of the Spear, if you remember, is about the five missionaries from the North American missionaries from the United States who were trying back in 1954, 55, 56, were trying to reach the Wadoni tribesperson. And this group of tribe people were living in remote 
area of the jungles of Ecuador. And they had a lot of different views about life. But their main view about life is nobody's coming <laughs> into where we are. And if you do, you're going to risk your own life by coming. And even if it was someone who was not their enemy that came, they often would spear. That's what's called the end of the spear. They would spear that person to death. In fact, they would often spear each other to death because they couldn't get along. Anger was their big thing. Hatred was their big thing. Even when some of their families split off and were another tribe, if they would, they would if that tribe ever did something to them again, it was just like eye for eye, tooth for tooth, revenge, revenge. Revenge. There's one point of the movie, in fact, Minkaya, who's one of the main characters, is, is beginning to question himself. Why, why? Why do we keep doing this? How long is this going to go on? You know, you kill my brother, I kill your brother. You know, it's, it's just going on and on. And so these five missionaries who had a heart for Jesus Christ also had a heart for the Wadani people. Nate Saint was one of those. The famous two were Nate Saint and Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott, often known by his wife Elizabeth Elliott, who wrote uh, wonderful books about all of this as well. They had a heart to reach people for Christ. And they had a heart to love people for Christ. And they knew there was a better way for the Wadani people than to kill each other. And, you know, they don't know a whole lot about the Wadani people, but they wanted to make contact with them, basically to share the love of Jesus Christ. And you'll see, uh, Tom's going to throw up a slide here. And uh, in, in that slide, you'll see the Piper plane that, that Nate Saint had. He was an aviator, and, and that would become key. And you'll see he's actually with uh, one of the Wadani uh, ladies there on the first time they would land on the beach there. But before they landed to make contact, they had a bucket. And he could fly that plane in such a tight circle. And Daryl, you would know all about this, but you know the, the bucket would hardly move. And so when they lowered it down, they, they had gifts in the bucket. And it said the Watani people actually enjoyed the gifts. A lot of chicken they put in there, other kinds of trinkets and things, and they looked forward to getting that. That was their way of trying to build this place to have a relationship. And so they felt like finally it was time to land there on a beach near there, and they landed the plane, and that's when you see a picture of Nate Saint and, and this uh, Watani woman who had come to see who they were. Well, that, that time went, went well. But the next time they landed, some things had gotten stirred up within the tribe. And some, it's, it's corner which book you read or, or which movie you watch. Some say it was a, a fellow who was in, in trouble who lied about who they were who had met him the first time. Another say it was one of the things that they had seen, the picture of one of the girls who had actually escaped from the group and, and actually would be living with the missionaries or some of the people near, nearby. And, and they saw that picture and they didn't understand all those things. But for whatever, they got the tribe all riled up. And the tribe men, including Minkaya, would, would spear to death all five of the uh, missionaries. And so Nate Saint, Jim Elliott, they, they understand the depth of what this word witness means. But it means something as well for us. Most of us probably going through this life might not give our lives physically like this, but, but we should this way. In another way, we are to die to ourselves and our control of privacy, someone writes, and schedules. Get that. How many of you through the COVID have, well, you're, you've kind of died to the control of your schedule. Now, some of you might not have, but we're like, someone said, you know, the most worthless gift I got beginning of the year was my 2020 calendar. You know, anybody else feel that way? I mean, at least for six, eight, ten, maybe all year, who knows? But there's something about that, that I think even in this, it's helped us sometimes die to ourselves in our control of our schedules and, and allowing us to become available to share, don't miss it, by life and action, what Christ means to us and can mean to other people. And so the word witness here just doesn't mean the time I get to walk out and, and for 30 minutes or an hour go share my faith in Jesus Christ or sit down with someone at the coffee shop and share. That's definitely a part of witnessing. The word witness is the whole lifestyle of who we are. Uh, in, in our devotion to Jesus Christ. And when I was thinking about that movie again and saw it, you know, I've always thought of the sacrifice of those five men who wanted to share the love of Christ. But maybe in a greater way, the witness of being there is just as powerful in that movie. Just some time after those five men, there's five grieving wives. There's a little grieving boy, eight-year-old Steve Saint. And there's a grieving aunt to Steve. Uh, Nate, Nate Saint's son was Steve. Uh, his sister is Rachel Saint. And she also had a heart 
for the Wadani people. And because of that young girl who had escaped the Wadani and was living with them, they, they found a way, two of those ladies, Rachel Saint and Elizabeth Elliot, and the, the young lady whose family was the Wadani tribe, all made a, inroads. They went back to the people who had killed their husbands and their brothers. And it's an amazing witness of who they are. In fact, you're going to see a picture. This is a picture of uh, Rachel Saint. Later in life, she would spend the rest of her life living among these people. She would, she would spend the rest of her life not only living among them, but sharing, uh, not only sharing Christ in words and in teaching, but one of the significant things that happens is uh, not long after she's there, there's a, a terrible flu, some, something breaks out, some kind of fever breaks out, and it would have been killing this tribe of Wadani people, but they had the medicines they needed for it, and so the ladies are inoculating the people and so forth. But another tribe doesn't have that. And in fact, it's their enemy, <laughs> and the enemy shows up because they're desperate. And things are changing in, among the Wadani tribes persons. It's changing a lot and to the point that they've allowed now the enemy to be treated by these American missionary ladies. It's, it's an amazing story of really the incarnational experience of some ladies who said, we're going to give our lives. This is witness and all that we're doing here. And you'll see the tone of that whole group of people start to change. You're going to see a picture of young Steve saying he was eight years old. And if you've seen the movie, the little cowboy hat, that's what they show in the movie, a picture of him and, and a picture of him with uh, Minkaya. Minkaya is probably 24, 25 years old in this picture. And Steve was eight because he went back with his aunt and, and, and Elizabeth Elliot when they first went back into the jungle. And it's amazing that picture of, the, he, he doesn't realize at this point that Minkaya is the one who speared his father. But Minkaya helps him. And, and over the years, Steve Saint will end up traveling back and forth to see his family and also to be there among the people. We're going to come back to that story in a moment. But I think of, I think of testimonies. What was the real testimonies of people? How in the world could they live like that? You know, what was it about them? They obviously understood that this power of the ascension of Jesus Christ, they obviously were living by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the focus. Jesus says at the end, it's amazing, you know, the, the disciples at the end of this passage I read, they're staring up, looking at, at the ascension. And, and that's when the angels, the two men in white, show up and, and say, hey, guys, yeah, you've probably stared long enough. Guess what? I think Jesus gave you some instructions, right? It's time to do those things. That's what we need to focus on. And the end of that says the real focus needs to be on who Jesus Christ is. And the focus of this chapter 1, chapter 2, about what it means to be a witness, first of all, is about a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Secondly, it's about the power. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit. And third, it's about the program. Just another P word uh, that somebody else wrote. It was a P word that you put in there. I don't call them programs. We've got a kind of bad name for programs. But maybe the strategy of the church. And so what about this ascension and power? The, the focus of all of this is our witness to the person, to Jesus Christ. He is the object of what, who we share about. In, 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 in an incredible kind of way, He's the authority of the witness that we have to share as well. It really is all about Jesus. The missionary activity of the early church rested not only on Jesus' mandate to witness, but also on His living presence both in heaven and His living presence in us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we think about that, it's not only um, what Jesus said and to wait on the power of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of Christ, but what happened in the action of His ascension. In fact, in Hebrews, Hebrews lets us in on a real important thing. It says, we do have such a high priest who sat down, and speaking of Jesus' ascension, who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, and who, get this about Jesus, now he's ascended to sit down at the throne of majesty, the right hand of the Father, who serves in the sanctuary. How about that? Jesus Christ is still serving us. We know he's interceding for us. He's in the true tabernacle. But it's important that when Jesus ascended, he sat down. Remember the Old Testament? Remember where forgiveness of sins came from? Because a whole bunch of priests had to keep sacrificing goats and lambs and, and applying the blood. Guess what? Priests in the Old Testament did not sit down. 
You know why they didn't sit down? Because their job never ended. Their job was not sufficient to pay the price for sin. It pointed to who is sufficient. And so when Jesus sat down, it is the recognition of God the Father that He, Jesus Christ, and and we know He's the, the sacrifice, but He now enters heaven as the final, ultimate, perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. And it's about all the things He did. Now I want to go back to Minkaya in the jungle of Ecuador. I, I like the movie that shows Minkaya's spiritual struggle. In fact, these folks, they, um, you know, there was a lot of strange ideas about God, let's put it that way. Uh, they had this idea of the Creator. They had this idea of the great boa and different kinds of things. And Minkaya, in seeing all the death around him and taking place, and probably not knowing if he might be the next one to get speared, wondered how in the world he had heard from people previous to him, his ancestors, that you had to jump the great boa. Well, all that meant was, wow, what happens when I die? Where do I go? And it's that struggle that he has, or what do I do? Does it only happen after death? And the amazing thing, because those ladies were being witnessed, not only witnessed in their actions and their love, they're able to tell him, Minkaya, you don't have to do anything. This is what Christ has done for you. Those things in the gospel that Christ had already done, he's done for you. And through his death, he's paid the price for your sin. Well, that was a free news for the Wandani people. In fact, many of them come to Jesus Christ. And that's our story. Guys, when we share our testimony, we'll see on Pentecost, the main things they're talking about are the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you'll repent and believe, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as well. He is the focus of all of who we are. He is the sacrifice. But He also entered, and and all, all hail the power of Jesus' name, He also enters and sits on the throne. That's important because now He is the King of kings, if you want to say it that way. He has entered also as the absolute sovereign ruling authority of the universe. There's nothing above Christ. It's all below. In fact, an authority or who He is as King, but also as servant in heaven as well. You know, when Paul was praying for the Ephesians, he prayed about Jesus' ascension and how important it was part of his prayer. And this is what he says in Ephesians. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And he said, this is why I'm asking that you might get the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Let me just start there. This is about knowing who Jesus Christ is. And oh, excellent Theophilus, I want to continue not only to tell you that Christ died for you, but you can have not only a relationship with you, but He can live in you and you can know Him better. This was Paul for the Ephesians as well. And then this, and His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of His mighty strength which He exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Now get this, He's seated there for far above all authority, power, and dominion and every title that can be given. Not only in the present age, but in the age to come. And God, get this, God placed all things under His feet and appointed Him, Christ, to be head of over everything for the church. Now, our real question, is he head of the church? Is he the head of us? Is he our leader? Is he our king as well? Which he's head of the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills everything every day. And the powerful thing about Ephesians is this. You know, it it tells us because of Jesus, not only his death and resurrection, but because of his ascension as well, he tells us what our position is as a newborn believer. And that's really cool. That's in, that's in Ephesians chapter 2. After he told about, here's Jesus now seated on the throne. And then he says this very familiar verse, but because of his great love for us, what's this go back to? The great love of God for us. God who is rich in mercy, that means he's just saturated in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So he's talking about the salvation experience for us and 
God raised us up with Christ, now that's part of being the new creation, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now, he's talking about me right now, you right now, in that sense, we're seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God has prepared for us in advance. It's a powerful passage. And so what he's saying, as the king, as the authority, I'm placing you in, in the sense of my authority. We know he sent out the disciples and the great commission with his authority well. But does he have first place? in our lives as the sovereign king, and that's important. And then, how can we witness? How can people witness like Rachel saying after someone had killed her brother and Elizabeth Elliot after someone had killed her? Well, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we know that Jesus, in the simplicity of all, he had to leave so that the Holy Spirit could come and live within us. It's not just Christ with us, but the Spirit of Christ in us. And by the way, it's used interchangeably throughout the Bible, Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, Spirit of Christ. And sometimes we get confused, but it's the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And, as, and, as, um, and I appreciate Daryl doing the children's sermon because they were given some instructions. You know, Pentecost obviously hadn't happened. We realize we live post-Pentecost, but we still need the power of the Holy Spirit. And he told them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. And it is a gift. By the way, only Jesus can save and only Jesus can sanctify. Only Jesus can fill with the Spirit. We can put ourselves in a position to receive, but He's the only one who can do that, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And guess what? After the angels told the apostles, okay, you've looked long enough. Jesus is going to come back. He'll come back that same way in His glory, in all of His manifest glory. But right now, you got something to do, and you got to actively wait. And it wasn't just waiting. It was actively waiting. And it says they meet for 10 days. Now, imagine this. It's a 10-day prayer meeting. It says they were constantly in prayer. There's 120 people there constantly in prayer. Now, you got to think about that. There's the disciples who at one time often were in competition with each other. Who's the greatest? They're all together. Now, the resurrections happen. Are there still some problems between the disciples? Think about it. The brothers of Jesus are there. You know, the disciples weren't really high on the brothers of Jesus. You know why? Because they wanted to take them all the way back to Nazareth. And then maybe, we don't know, was Nicodemus a Pharisee there? Well, you think about that collection of 120 people. What they are doing is praying. I think it was Lloyd Ogilvie said, you know, I imagine as they were praying, something began to happen to them. They began to understand their need to confess, as we often do. And maybe their need to reconcile differences. And I, I can see that very clearly because I know when I pray in those kinds of situations, whether it's waiting on the power of Christ to come. I'll never forget going to my Emmaus walk in 1985. And uh, there was a, another seminarian on that walk. His name was John Massey. And when I went for that weekend, I'd been in Kentucky, folks, like two and a half months. Had no clue where I was going. Um, culture, they, they, they took me down the back roads of uh, Burksville near the Tennessee line. Now, city boy out of Pensacola, man, I was, like, I was hearing the dueling banjos, you know, we were going to that camp. It was a clay road camp, and you know, I didn't know what was going to happen there, to be honest with you. But I do know, but you know what happened was the Holy Spirit showed up and as the power of the Holy Spirit was really neat. But I saw this guy I didn't like from seminary. His name was John Massey. I'd never had talked to John. I would just see him in the gym or in a class or something. You know why I didn't like him? Now, this is pre-meeting Sheila days, okay? So keep that in mind. I didn't like him because he and I liked the same girl at seminary. A red-haired girl that I kind of really liked. But I noticed he really liked her too. And I don't, I haven't even taught this guy, but I'm mad at the guy. You know, who's he to think that? And, and I remember, and uh, what was crazy was we both end up on the Mayus. And on that special night when they give you some time to pray, you know what happens when you're praying like that? A whole bunch of people are praying. Suddenly, John Massey was on my heart. And I went to John and I, I told him, Man, John, I, I, I've been mad at you. I've been, and, and he kind of laughed. He said, you know what? I've been mad at you too. 
And we were at the altar of the Berksville United Methodist Church on our knees. And by the time we finished praying, we were laughing about it. Neither one of us asked that girl out. Thank God, because I met Sheila three months later. So, and, uh, but anyway, you know, that's what happens uh, to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lloyd Ogilvie says, you know, oftentimes people struggle in this waiting on the Holy Spirit and the power. We realize that when we accept Christ, the Spirit of Christ dwells in us. And he's talking about being filled. And, and Paul talks about keep being filled in this continued filling. But what is the thing we do as we open ourselves? Lloyd Ogilvie said this to a man one time. Recently, a man in my church came to talk to me about how to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And he observed the deep joy and contagious love in some people who openly identified its only source as the Spirit's indwelling in their life. He wanted what they had. I asked him if he knew the secret of their abundance. He did not. Knowing some of them... I knew that the floodgate was in their unreserved commitment to the Lord's first place sovereignty in their lives. He just thought it came about by some, well, don't you have to do the right thing or say the right word? Experience. I affirm that receiving the Spirit's power was preceded, don't miss this word, by a surrender of our wills and our relationships We took incisive inventory, including attitudes, prejudices, broken relationships, and then looked at his marriage, his money, his jobs, his plans for the future. And he discovered that he was running his own life with his own plans. And he was kind of shocked by that. But the same spirit, Lloyd writes, that woke him up to that was already at work in his life. And he received what he was asking and seeking and knocking for, as he would put, a freedom to live, a daring life of adventure in the kingdom of God, being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, Steve Saint was eight years old when his dad was killed. With his aunt and a few other members, first went back to live among them. He was with them, as I said earlier. Again, he would move back to the United States, start his own family, and only come to visit later. But he would know Minkaya. He did not know until much later in his life that Minkaya was the one who had killed his father. And in Wadoni, the Wadoni way was, if someone killed your father, the son was the one who was to take revenge. And in that movie, uh, Wadoni, now knowing Christ, he, he, he can't handle anymore, and he takes Steve while he's down there one time back on the beach, and you'll see that in the film, and he tells him that. And then, and then Minkaya just goes like this. He's, he's ready for Steve Saint to take his life. And it shows that. And, the, and Steve can't do it. it. The movie shows him just breaking down. And, and, and he has to work through this forgiveness of Minkaya. But he does. And in 1994, when Aunt Rachel, who had lived there all her life, ministering to these people. When she dies and they go back, they asked Steve, would he come and live among them? And they said, we don't want you to come and live among us just to do what you do as a missionary. We want you to come and live among us and show us how to do all those things you do for other people because that's what we want to do. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons um, I, I share that story is this movie came up. And it came upon my heart about a witness. But not only did the movie show up, when I began to look back online about some things, I discovered Minkaya. And by the way, their relationship, let me tell you a little bit about that. They they became so close. Um, Steve named one of his grandchildren, Minkaya. All the grandkids are God's children. children. Um, In fact, Minkaya really became the father of Steve Sane. I mean, it's an incredible relationship. And when they start going back to the United States. When the movie came out, Minkaya ends up going to the United States, to Canada, to India, and he starts sharing this incredible testimony of forgiveness and, and what a witness has meant for his life. And they would share together. Minkaya died last month. Didn't know it, I missed it. He died on uh, the 28th of April, 2020. They said he was either 88 or 91. They weren't quite sure. But this is the obituary that Steve Saint wrote. And to me, it's the powerful testimony of who Christ is. Steve Steve Saint's obituary of Minkaya, his adopted father, who has gone to be with the Lord. 
He was born into a violent Stone Age culture of the Amazon rainforest of eastern Ecuador, South America. Minkaya, whose name means wasp, died April 28, 2020, at home in the tiny village of Zapina of natural causes related to old age. He was between 81 and 91 years, 88 and 91 years of age. Minkaya is survived by his wife. I can't pronounce her name, but it means otter, if you want to know. 13 children, 50-some grandchildren, many, many great-grandchildren, and tens of thousands of people who saw him as proof of God's redeeming and transforming power. When Grandfather Menkai, as we affectionately knew him, helped five other Wadani warriors spear my father, Nate St., Jim Elliott, Pete Fleming, Roger Yudarian, and Ed McCauley to death on a river sandbar in 1956, there was no reason to believe that anyone outside of his small clan and the five bereaved families would ever take notice of that incident. Nevertheless, mil millions of people in North America and Europe followed radio releases that five North American missionaries were missing in the Ecuadorian jungle. For most of a week, there was no word of their fate. When a search party finally found their five spear-riddled bodies, the question was, why? Why? The term tragedy accompanied virtually every radio, newspaper, and magazine article as the news of these vicious and seemingly senseless killings spread. Now this again is his obituary. But 64 years later, it seems clear that Genesis 50-20 was about to come true again. What man meant for evil, God meant for good. There's been no greater ambassador of that message than the life of Grandfather Wasp. Minkai is also the main character in the feature film, End of the Spear. And when the End of the Spear uh, in, in book and movie form came out and was available, Minkai traveled around the United States and Canada telling his life story. This amazing jungle warrior who counted only up to 20 on his fingers and his toes personally impacted hundreds of thousands of people in audiences as large as 45,000. The movie in which his life plays the leading role has now been translated into mother tongues of approximately, get this, one quarter of the world's population. I'll let that sink in. Minkaya's most frequent speaking theme was, we lived angry, hating, and killing for no reason. Until they brought us God's markings. Now those of us who walk God's trail live happily and in peace. And then he would often ask me, this is Steve saying, how long did you have God's markings before you brought them to us? Steve said, well, I don't know. And then Minkaya said, well, maybe if we'd had known sooner, when Gangi, the creator, did not see it, excuse me, did not see it well that people should live angry and hating and killing for no reason, we could have walked God's trail sooner. Saint goes on to say, there are people who question the motives of the five missionaries who made contact with the Wodani in 1956. There are some who question Minkaya's motives in participating in 10 speaking tours to the U.S. and Canada and trips to Europe, Panama, and even to India. I can only answer that I was Minkaya's traveling companion on all those road trips. We traveled together, ate together, shared the same room, spoke together. I've known Minkaya since I was a little boy when he took me under his wing and had his sons teach me to do a blowgun hunt. He was one of my dearest friends in the world. Yes, he killed my father, but he loved me and he loved my family. And one of my grandsons is named Minkaya. We will miss you, Minkaya, but we hold on to the certain hope that we'll see you again. And that is just the powerful of who God is when Christ is lifted up, when we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, you don't even hardly have to plan the program in some ways, huh? Steve Stank probably never wrote down. A quarter million people might hear this testimony. That's the way God works. That's who He is. And that's why we don't skip Ascension Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen. We're thankful for the ladies. And as you're at home on this Ascension Day, just thank God again for who Jesus is. As He ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, both as our absolute sacrifice. Guys, you're not too bad. that You cannot be forgiven by Jesus Christ. He's paid the price for every sin of ours. He is the absolute ruling authority and king as well. And his authority can live through us also. And he can live in us in his Holy Spirit, dwelling deep, that we will be his witnesses.
I don't know what songs they sang in, in Kaya's service, but that could have been one of them. Let me show you how great God is. Let us go and be His witnesses in our lives of love to others. In the words we share of who Jesus is as we lift Him up, go now in His powerful name. Amen.